This talk is an outline for a project to promote the use of geometric algebra as a tool in technical communication. A um, little introduction to this talk. First, I'm going to be describing some resources I want to make for helping young physicists understand geometric algebra. Uh, then I'll be a bit philosophical in the middle section and talk about geometry programming as a path to fundamental understanding for young people. Uh, and in part three, I'll describe some thoughts I have on a geometric algebra based editor for young computer scientists. Um, I plan on spending maybe seven or eight years in, on this project. Uh, I may need to adapt the aims, which is a euphemistic way of saying that I probably won't achieve a lot of them, um, but it's okay. Uh, I plan on self-funding for a few years uh, and may later seek investment if that makes sense. Um, the out general output will be software and videos. Um, scientific publications may be involved as well, but they'll be a means to an end. Um, so, okay, part one, uh, resources for helping young physicists understand geometric algebra. Uh, so, what do a lot of us want? We want cultural change in physics, which is to say that we want to get rid of all of this stuff over here um, and replace it with, uh, you know, geometric algebra, with the geometric algebra of three space, Clifford algebra, whatever you want to call it, G13, um, maybe PGA, uh, uh, yeah. Um, in a strong sense, we want to be visual about it. Um, so I, well, or I want to be visual about it, certainly. Um, so mm, I've got, I've, you know, uh, we can use, we can say geometric algebra, but uh, I want people to understand things like bivectors, which are visualized here. Um, it's pretty hard to get cultural change in physics. So uh, in my opinion, what is needed is a significant groundswell in undergrad, um, by which I mean young people. I think that's sort of the only way. Uh, people unspoilt by the cross product and stuff like that. Um, and so... Uh, uh, therefore, uh, like Mike Munger over here, I plan to make an undergraduate course on YouTube, very high production values, um, with a title, something like 3D Maths for Physics and Graphics. Um, it would be accessible to high school students, um, and uh, yeah. As a general outline, it would uh, I'd want to cover these topics, classical mechanics, geometric calculus, electrodynamics, space-time algebra, quantum mechanics, and computer graphics. Um, ideally, you'd have these two, these ones as well. Um, uh, but yes, it, it, an, an undergraduate course. Um, I, sir, I believe that um, science is extremely fun to learn when you have physical demonstrations and visualizations of what you're talking about. Um, it, it's also the case that I would say that um, seeing the goal of learning as being to understand something well enough to sort of simulate it, either in your head or using a computer, um, that is, if you have the ability to simulate something, then that sort of means that you've got a good understanding of it kind of philosophical there for a second, but yeah, we want physical demonstrations of fun, who could object? Um, so one thing that uh, I think that we can have uh, because of advances in technology, especially computer vision, um, is mixed and aug augmented reality as a part of uh, physics education. Um, so I'll just show, uh, I've got, uh, I've made videos, you can watch this one on YouTube, um, but, um, so this is kind of an example of something that I'd like to have. So, you know, physical demonstration, um, something, something angular momentum, uh, very, very beautiful there. Um, and what I'm going to do with this video, um, I have created in advance. Um, so if we watch it again, here you can see that we've got this little black line um, little geometric primitive, and you can think of it as a vector. Um, you know, it starts here, and it uh, attaches to this point. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I had to hand edit this video. This is quite annoying to make. Uh, but in my opinion, we'll have quite a lot of stuff like this around us all the time fairly soon. Um, either you, yeah, probably augmented reality headsets. I don't know, maybe it'll have some other form. Um, uh, there's an interesting place called Dynamic Land uh, where they have things like this little uh, illustration of airflow across a car. It's very interactive. Um, and really, there's a good talk by, there's a good paper by Alan Kay um, talking about uh, uh, teaching kids um, Galilean relativity and uh, uh, basic physics. Um, using a video court of uh, weights falling. Um, it, it's really a good way of sort of bridging, there's a bit of a gap between everyday experience and uh, the sort of abstract mathematics that you get to think about uh, in, a, in a lecture. Um, if, you're a, if you've been doing physicist, physics for a very long time, that you don't see the gap at all. You kind of feel like maths is everywhere. Um, or physics is everywhere, geometry is everywhere, whatever. Uh, but if you've never experienced those visualizations, if you're not used to thinking about the world in that way, even seeing static pictures like this one are not real. They're kind of, that. Well, they're not enough for a lot of people to help them see um, how physics is a description of their everyday life, um, and so. You know, pictures like this are very, very helpful. Uh, probably somebody spent a little while making this picture, um, but we want, we want, we want footage. I would say, um, and so I'd want to make a physics course based on uh, help you know, with the goal of simulating stuff like this. Um, maybe also, so here's another one. This is just just a kind of cheesy animation that I made. Um, very simple thing, but you can imagine like giving it as an exam question or something like that, like model this vector, this vector connecting like the origin to the position of this flower attached to this unicycle. Okay. Um, and uh, for assignments in this course, um, I yeah, I, I'd like uh, I'd like to have them reproduce the behavior of specifically multivectors, which, as we know, are um, a fairly low dimensional, elegant uh, way of mm, summarizing a lot of physics. Uh, so we want students must make simulations that reproduce the behavior of multivectors. Um, uh, here's a quite nice uh, interface someone's got for creating, do, you know, doing ordinary physics, doing the, writing the kinds of things that you would usually write in a physics exam as a way, as a method of input to a computer. Um, it may seem, I don't know, maybe it's sort of anachronistic to try and have like handwriting and also a tablet. It's like, why not just use a keyboard, but you know, Sketching pictures is an important part of uh, learning physics and maths. Um, so I'd want people to be able to give input this way. Um, it's also the case that uh, uh, in computer science culture now, it's quite common to assess people using um, sort of a notebook interface uh, or so, um, Codabyte is an example of a website where you can sort of do interview questions, like give people a small computer science exam, essentially. Um, and uh, they, it's kind of a better interface for, well, I guess I think that the computer is a good interface for um, learning geometric algebra generally. Um, and so I'd want people to while they're doing assignments, not just like, you know, write uh, symbols and try to simulate in their heads something. I want them to be able to, you know, write something into a computer and have the computer help them um, 
help them simulate the thing that they have just written down. Um, so, okay. Uh, that's uh, the sort of core philosophy for the for the physics course aspect of this project. Um, I'd want to sort of like break off a part of the physics course when it's finished um, and make essentially a video game about CL21. Um, yeah, or maybe something, maybe a higher algebra, but... Um, uh, this, this uh, apologies. There's quite a lot of words on this slide that I just have to read out. Um, I, I'm summarising quite a lot of my career here, and I don't, don't want to get too much into it. But um, there's uh, these talks that I gave previously um, that uh, you can watch if you want more detail. So, um, fun games are systems that kids of all ages want to under uh, that fun games make kids want to understand systems. Um, no lectures are needed. You don't you don't want any lectures. You you kids are kind of self propelled when they learn stuff. And there's great games out there now, like Incredipede. There's many many others. Um, Velocity Raptor is an example of a game about special relativity. Um, and these games uh, have really quite sophisticated science simulated um, in front of you, in a way that's accessible to a child, someone with no mm, a nine year old. A six-year-old, whatever. Um, games uh, involve visualized mathematical entities. Um, when I say mathematical entities, I mean they're, they're on a computer, so they have to be described with numbers. Um, they're mathematical entities. Uh, they move, collide, and they react to each other. Um, uh, that's a very general description of a game. And, uh, yeah, so... Having objects with some behavior in relation to one another, that's kind of a description of geometric algebra as well. Um, uh, fun games have many things happen in them, but so there's quite a lot, wide variety of things that happen in a game, even one like Call of Duty or something like that. Um, but uh, they are fundamentally simple. Games are simple and are determined logically by minimal fundamentals, i.e. they are natural slash elegant. So you think about something like Texas Hold'em, you think about something like uh, Go or chess. Um, these games, uh, there's a really wide variety of things that, you know, an expert player of them can tell you happen inside the game, but their rules can be explained very quickly. Um, and this this feeling of oh wow this this game this system is very natural slash elegant, um, and and yet it has so much uh, variety, so much richness. Um, there's this big space of possibilities that come out of these simple things, un but understandable things. Um, that's exactly the reaction that we want people to have to geometric algebra, to see how geometric algebra unifies geometry, complex analysis, trigonometry, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, whatever else you like. Um, we Usually those things get taught quite separately, certainly they get ta taught separately in school and it's only until you reach like first year of undergrad that you get to see how they're related to one another. Um, but yes, in geometric algebra, trigonometry um, and uh, yeah, other things have, they sit together just in a way that we can visualize. Um, and lastly, despite its minimal axioms, geometric algebra has many immediate applications, which is good for this format. So um, I've talked about this elsewhere, but a lot of the problem with a lot of different scientific, a lot of the problem with a lot of mathematical systems is that they're, they're, Either they don't have very many applications, maybe think something like topology. I mean, in a manner of speaking, topology has a lot of applications, but they're not very immediately accessible. If you want, if you're talking to a member of the public um, and you want to say, oh, this area of mathematics is useful for this, um, topology is not a great place to start because if you do give one of the examples of places where topology is useful, like in neuroscience, You've got to spend ages describing, for example, what a neuron is. Um, 
Uh, whereas geometric algebra, as we kind of see in these nice um, uh, in you know diagrams like this, uh, geometric algebra it has an immediate visualization for its applications, um, and there's a lot of them. Um, there's really, really a lot of them. Low-hanging fruit. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and rather philosophical, but uh, a side aim to this project is um, also uh, something else that this project might be useful for is exposing the elegance and naturalness specifically of quantum mechanics. So first I need to say a little bit about these two, uh, or at least specifically Scott Aronson. So Scott Aronson, quantum computing researcher, says, quantum mechanics is what you would inevitably come up with if you started from probability theory and then said, let's try to generalize it so that the numbers we use we used to call probabilities can be negative numbers. Uh, he says the following thing later on in his, uh, in his book, uh, tongue, in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way, I can give you a couple of arguments for why God decided to square the amplitudes, the complex amplitudes of the wave function. Um, and as an example of that, he later says, the complex numbers are algebraically closed. So all of this stuff, he, he has the, the sort of Scott Aronson spiel is that uh, quantum mechanics is something that humans were had forced upon them by experiment at some point. Um, and in a way, a lot of us... Well, in a lot, in a way, it initially seemed, in a way, it's ugly or it's aberrant or it defies intuition. Certainly defies intuition. Um, but Scott Ar and and it's often taught that way. You know, you you talk about the double slit experiment, blah blah blah. Um, Scott Aronson just and Eliezer Yudkowsky to a large extent off uh, off try to give a different feeling for quantum mechanics. They, they say, no, look, quantum mechanics, um, if if you, they, they try to make it seem so natural that uh, if it didn't exist, if you hadn't had it forced upon you by experimental evidence, you would want to invent quantum mechanics. You would be interested to invent it because it's just so very, very natural. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they the way that they these two that these two do it is um, rather uh, algebraic in nature, um, or certainly it's a lot of talking and they use a lot of algebra. It, in a way, I would sort of link them with David Hestonies. David Hestonies says uh, it is only in a theory with electron spin that one can see why the wave function is complex. Um, this fact is not common knowledge because the geometric meaning of the wave function lies buried in the standard matrix version of the Pauli theory. And uh, I don't I'm not I don't understand the history of the rediscovery of geometric algebra that well, but my understanding is that David Hestonies seized upon geometric algebra uh, because he was motivated by this kind of thing, because he wanted to find um, some way of certainly some way of visualizing um, the Pauli matrices, uh, the Dirac matrices. Um, uh, so, and I, and I kind of, I just feel like it's kind of a match made in heaven, these two, right? Um, the visualization can be a way of making things feel very natural, I would say. Um, and to bring in one last uh, you know, very important person to show that this is you know, can be very very serious, um, Paul Dirac uh, had a feeling for quantum mechanics that it, we still maybe don't understand. There's a there's a good article um, from which I got this quote. Um, Paul Dirac said. I'm just no good at doing masses of algebraic calculations without picturing what the equations mean. Um, which is a very interesting thing to say coming from him. Uh, 
I have I've not read his original publications, but I understand that they are mostly algebra and no no visualizations. Um, pot, why is that? Maybe because maybe because um, he was constrained by the medium of his time. Like it's not easy to put in a picture in a scientific publication. It's certainly impossible, essentially, to put a animation inside of a um, scientific publication. Um, but um, yeah, he, he, he had a very, very visual sense for quantum mechanics and he totally wanted to, his work was, you know, as I understand it, motivated by um, what, wanting quantum mechanics to feel natural. Okay. Um, and this is kind of a philosophical point, but uh, yeah, is, is geometric algebra um, usable, maybe even more usable, without algebra. When I say algebra, uh, I mean it in the way that I meant when I was talking about this slide. Um, I mean it in, I don't mean it in like abstract algebra or modern algebra, uh, like, you know, commutativity, associativity, that kind of thing. I mean in the way that a high school student understands the word algebra, where you are talking about, where you represent uh, uh, entities and data as uh, symbols that you write down. Um, on the left here, you know, uh, okay, the, this is distributivity and associativity, so that's modern algebra. Um, but uh, while these are two things that are certainly in geometric algebra, slash Clifford algebra, um, but, you know, there are, that that's not the only way of seeing it all. Um, uh, certainly everything has a geometric interpretation, as David Hesterney's, you know, as, as was his mm, a big motivation for him, and, uh, you know, we've got stuff like this, so this is Icosians, which is a board game made by uh, the f sort of the first geometric algebra person, uh, William Roman Hamilton. Um, here are the, here's an illustration of the Dirac scissors, um, and a, a visualization that Paul Dirac did come up with to explain uh, the topology slash algebra of the double the double cover property of SU two, um, and then uh, so Rubik's cubes are familiar to literally every human being in the Western world, probably, and you know these do these things are highly. They are mathematical objects with an algebra describing them. Um, and if you get super into Rubik's Cubes, yeah, there's there's stuff in there about, uh, about the nature of rotations. So um, to sort of, my specific question is, from working with a visualization with behavior that rigorously embodies geometric algebra, so a visualization with behavior, you know, interactive visualization, basically a video game is what I mean by that. Um, can you use axioms like we want to do? Like, can you use associativity? Can you prove theorems um, like subalgebra closure, the kind of thing that Quant that Scott Aronson thinks is, well, views as very important. Um, uh, can you write computer programs such as tetrahedron line intersection? Um, this is a very deep question to me. Okay. Uh, do you, so mm, that uh, tells you a lot about what I'm thinking for physics. Um, but the physics is one part of this. Um, there's a bigger thing going on, um, which is uh, geometry. Uh, and I'm going to summarize a bunch in this in this section. Uh, geometry programming as a path to fundamental understanding for young people. Uh, and first it's worth understanding a little bit about this guy, Seymour Papert. Um, so there's something that you might, well, that's the, the Papertian program in education. Um, and I'm going to summarize it as saying that we ought to engineer transparent tools for thought that inspire projects. That's how we should aim to educate um, young students. And uh, the so Seymour Papert was 
uh, a polymath. He was a mathematician, psychologist, computer scientist. Um, and along with these two, uh, uh, Cynthia Solomon and Wally Foot, Forzig, Foot. Oh dear, I should have looked it up. Um, they uh, in the in the sixties, no, no less the the nineteen sixties before um, before the idea of the personal computer. Really, um, they were thinking about using computers for education. Um, they they had this thing called the uh, turtle. Um, this is a little robot that kids can use to draw pictures. Um, and that's uh, when, when you think uh, as an example of a project, you might set set yourself. A kid might be inspired to set themselves the project of, oh, I want to make a spiral of this kind of thing, or I want to draw a picture of a house. Um, there's uh, now um, uh, graphical user interfaces for the the turtle, um, and S uh, Papa had lots of very interesting thoughts about well about this tool. Um, but very generally about uh, not only mathematics education, but um, the the way that humans think about information as such. Um, uh, yeah, and have to move on really. But it's very deep, and there's nothing that there's there's very little that you can say about mathematics education that Seymour Papert didn't anticipate in some way. Um, so the Papert program, we might call it, uh, where one tries to make tools that inspire projects that require some mathematical understanding from the child, um, has been extremely fruitful. Uh, so this guy, Alan Kay, um, created something called Smalltalk, which essentially was the personal computer. It led to that which we now call personal computing, the Apple II yeah, again, it's a rabbit hole. Um, it, he later on worked on something called, well, made something called Squeak, which led to something else called Scratch. Scratch is now the main way of teaching kids uh, programming. It's an excellent way of doing it. Certainly the best that exists right now. Um, Colin and Sarah Northway, um, actually they're not directly inspired by Papa, but they've got a very good video game called Fantastic Contraption. Um, and uh, other things like one laptop per child was inspired by Papert uh, uh, and then um, these two are uh, modern people um, pursuing the Papert program um, so I'm not alone in trying to do this uh, among other things geometric algebra makes from scratch development as in um, so the development of 3D software is complicated and arduous, um, but uh, you can do it more easily if you've got geometric algebra. Geometric algebra allows you to understand things like quaternions, rotations. Um, mm, so obviously, it's, it can do parabolas. You can do that with you can do that without geometric algebra, but geometric algebra makes all that stuff so much easier. And I think it's a very good fit for the Papert program. Um, so you can obviously make video games with uh, with geometric algebra, do lots of computer graphics. So chemical constraints was uh, during my PhD. I partly looked at this and um, an interface for allowing scientists to make arbitrary chemical constraints um, would be very helpful. Um, virtual reality user interface is something that I think a lot, a lot of, there's going to be a strong need to make it um, easier for people to develop that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, robotics and quantum computing, you know, what's not to like about those? How could a kid not be interested in that? Um, so, and this is just this is a point worth making. Um, the culture around three D games and three D game engines has become the anti Papert. So Papert Seymour Papert was you know he was one of like the first people to do computer graphics to think about computer graphics, um, and he sort of said, "Oh, computer graphics is great because it'll allow." people to, it'll give 
lots and lots of people a handle on understanding mathematics. However, um, the industry has kind of gone in the opposite direction. Um, it didn't start out that way. So in the 19, in 1985 to the 2000s, everybody rolls their own, as we say in, in, in software. Uh, programmers have to implement their own quaternion libraries, their own matrices, uh, their own scene graph. Um, but uh, since 2010, um, you have middleware. So Unreal and Unity and Godot and Minecraft and Dreams, I guess now. Um, and uh, these things are very, are, are wonderful tools um, that, you know, have enabled the development of great games like Mushroom 11 and uh, uh, Ori in the Blind Forest. Um, however, if you compare game, it's, there's lots of innovation that happens with games and there's, there's lots of in innovation that um, uh, Unity and Unreal are enabling. However, um, there's certain kinds, there's certain kinds of things that Unity and Unreal encourage you to do, um, and these th so things like uh, back 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 in the two thousands you had stuff like Shadow of the Colossus, Gish, um, Katamari Damacy, uh, and these things are much more likely to be made, I would claim, by a person who is making their own engine. You know, not that it's impossible to make Katamari Damacy or Gish in uh, Unreal or Unity. It's just, is it more likely? And I won't, I won't go into too much detail on that. But the thing to point out is that the these things, the the demand for Unreal and Unity has come about in large part because of mathophobia, which is, um, which is a word. I promise. Uh, I think that Seymour Papert invented it. Certainly, he talks about it a lot, um, and it's, it is what it exactly what it sounds like, the, the fear of mathematics that a lot of people have, um, and the idea of, oh gosh, if there's some way of doing this thing that I want to do in a way that m lets me avoid mathematics, then people quite understandably um, choose to do it that way. Um, but, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a little unfortunate, because it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and something that you're seeing now because of video streaming in large part, um, maybe other reasons, but, um, there's this thing called live coding. Uh, you can even go to events where you see this done. Um, and, uh, live coding. Yeah. It's when you watch somebody program something. Um, and I would say that it's very good. Uh, and it encourages, you know, it, it's a path to fundamental understanding, um, which you don't really get from Unreal and Unity. It's it's a path to, you know, well, certainly being becoming a better programmer, um, but uh, it's in need of improvement. So uh, it's got, there's ups and downs. Like on the one hand, um, learning from, co from live coding is, you know, it gives you a more realistic impression of program of the programming process, which has with bugs and all, um, much more realistic impression of that than you get from looking at code on GitHub, which is like crystallized and perfect. Well, hopefully perfect. Um, it's in a certain state. Uh, it's in a finished state, um, whereas the programming that you do that real people do really is in a state of flux. It's partly in your head. Um, but on the other hand, it's not completely realistic to look at somebody doing live coding because usually pr practically everybody who does live coding, like they already know what they're going to do by heart. There's this kind of spectator sport thing going on. Um, I just heard somebody, so a friend said that his professor said that if you want to be a mathematician, you must practice, practice. Maths is not a spectator sport. Um, and you know, yeah, are you, 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 it's fun. It can be fun to watch these videos, but are you really learning anything from them? Like not completely, not all the time. So a good thing, another good thing about them is that they have, uh, they are, there's a good culture, um, of doing things from scratch. Um, 
you can get that kind of fundamental understanding from the, um, see that kind of fundamental understanding in them at least. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's the code is somewhat unreadable. So when you're coding something yourself, when you are the person deciding what this fair deciding you know that there's going to be this variable and then you write the name of the variable and then you assign a type and you assign a value um, the variable is in your head as a programmer making that variable if you're a person watching that variable be made not so much ne not necessarily um, it's uh, live coding is aspirational there's lots of, you can watch great Get developers on YouTube, um, Casey Miratori, Jonathan Blow, Sean Barrett, um, uh, yeah, Chris DeLeon, uh, this guy, but, um, and, and you can learn a lot from them, uh, but at the same time it can be a bit boring, especially if you're a beginner, even if they're, even if they're like a person with a lot of character, you know, it's, it's just a person typing, it, it's you don't even you don't even get debug visualizations because often because of this thing that I talked about earlier the um, this thing of uh, the the demonstrator already knows what they're going to do by heart um, and there's I, I just have to show you this clip from Casey Miratori um, it, so he was asked in a, after a live stream um, where he was making his game Handmade Hero. Um, why start from scratch um, versus using an engine? Why reinvent the wheel? The, somebody who, I guess, maybe stumbled into the stumbled into the stream. Um, and got to play this video. And so while there's nothing wrong with making games in engines, because that may be the most efficient way for you to make the thing that you want to make, I don't think you can have a complete game development education as a programmer without learning how everything works right down to the core principles that have been true uh, for the past several decades. That's how a CPU runs a game. And so I think those are essential to learn and I wanted to show them. So if people want to use engines, that's totally fine. Uh, but that is the opposite of what I'm trying to show here. I want to show how all that stuff works uh, and I want to give people the ability to make their own engine stuff as necessary as well. Because even if you go use an engine like Unreal or something to make a game, knowing how all of it works underneath makes you so much more powerful even in that engine. Because now it means you don't just have to look at the docs and guess how the thing kind of is doing it. You know how the thing really works. And so you can go, oh, I know there must be a way for Unreal to do X, Y, Z because I know that's how the CPU works and I know it can do it. So let me go find how to do that or write my own plugin that can do that for me. And now you're so much more powerful. You don't have to be like hamstrung by the, the things that they allowed you to do in that sort of layer, right? So it's, it's empowering, it's educational, that's all good. Uh, but the second thing I wanted to point out is saying reinvent the wheel is a very misleading statement. And it always bothers me a little bit when people say things like, why reinvent the wheel? And the reason is because the wheel is an amazing invention. It is almost perfect, uh, or even possibly perfect, for what it does. When you look at a wheel, it is the thing that perfectly turns dynamic friction into static friction for moving objects, right? It's something that is so elegant and beautiful that if you asked me why you would want to reinvent it, I would say, of course you don't want to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is amazing. It has worked for thousands of years. It has been unchanged for thousands of years. The concept is the same today as it was uh, when they first made a wheel, probably, right? It does exactly the same stuff physically. Nothing we have developed in the past 30 years of game development is a wheel. We do not have a single wheel. If you think Unity is a wheel or you think Unreal is a wheel, that is just, it's just plain short-sighted. Like, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. In the future, we will have so much more powerful tools for game development that they will make the engines we use today look like a joke. People will laugh at the things that we did to make games today. And the reason that I point that out is not to diss on those things because they are the best engines we have today. So yes, if you need to use an engine, you want to use some of these things, right? 
But I want to point out the fact that if we want to get to a real wheel, that when you really do say to me, why would you reinvent the wheel? I would say, you shouldn't use the wheel. If we want to get to that wheel, we need people making new things that attempt to be a wheel. And you can't do that if all you know how to do is program stuff in Unreal or Unity because that's all you get. That's the square wheel, right? That's kind of clunking around. And if all you're ever going to do is build cars on top of that, they're going to be lousy. I love that clip. Um, I think it's maybe worth going back just a bit and clarifying. I'm using this phrase, fundamental understanding. Um, if, you, if you use Unity... Um, functions such as, you know, simulate rope or rotate vector to vector, you know, that, that can be a very good thing to do. That can help you build something that you want to build, which is great. But um, if as soon as, well, yeah, we've already gone through the reasons why you might want something a little bit better than just using a little thing like that. If you don't understand how it works, um, yeah, you're again hamstrung, and you need so you need that fundamental understanding. All right, and I'm doing okay for time, um, so the and we are in the final part now. So I'm going to talk about thoughts on a geometric algebra-based editor for young computer scientists. Um, and when I say editor, I mean you know text editor, code editor, something to make. A program with. Um, so there's a big problem in educational software, I guess you'd say, which is that we we there is not really enough high level tools. Uh, we want to make an interactive educational visualizations, but we don't have them. That's why you. I mean, there are there's many many educational technology things out there. But, um, you know, if you, ideally by this point, certainly Seymour Papert and Alan Kay, if you'd asked them in the 70s, you'd, they'd have said, you know, by, by 2020, probably every maths teacher will be able to, like, make a, a visualisation as their, an interactive visualisation as they're talking of anything that they please. Um, but it's really, there, there's, well, that's not possible, and even making stuff for teachers to make those things isn't possible because it's not that much money around for it. Um, I mean, there's some, but uh, it, yeah, is software development is expensive, um, and so you don't see as much as you might expect to. Um, high-level tools are the solution to that, um, and there are people making very nice high-level tools. So, Mathigon uh, has excellent um, sort of like an interface that kind of talks to you um, and uh, excellent ways of laying out text and all this. Uh, Penrose is an excellent tool for making like topological drawings for like scientific publications. Um, Econ Graphs, it's uh, visualizations for the very specific domain of economics. Um, uh, and uh, then Chalk Talk is a very, very ambitious system um, where you can have very wide variety of things, and you can make it as you, uh, and you can make simulations as you go, um, and uh, I want to make something like that as well. And I think geometric algebra is a good way to do that. Geometric algebra, again, it it touches so many domains. It's got so much expressive power, um, and yet it's extremely simple, um, and uh, so I want to do that. Um, I am in the habit of making uh, uh, 3D and VR educational visualizations. Um, I am certainly going to be making a bunch for the course. Um, and I believe that ge geometric algebra coding tools should help me make that. Therefore, it makes sense for me to try to develop such tools first um, and then try to use them. Uh, the term dog fooding means it's, it's dog food as in eat your own dog food. Um, uh, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so the, these are things you can watch on YouTube, uh, 3D visualizations uh, that I've made in the past. I'm pretty sure that both, all of the things that you see in both of these videos, um, I could have made better if I'd understood geometric algebra com comprehensively at the time, and I'd had a library to help me. Of course, there are lots of other, there are lots of libraries out there. Um, uh, I think that, I think that we need more than a library, though. I think we need something, again, more like an editor. Um, and one reason that I think we need something like that, some, something more than a library, certainly, is that ideally, I would like it to be the case that I can write I can make a system, I can make an interactive visualization um, out of code, and then that code can be part of the explanation that I give for the system itself. Um, uh, you can't do that with ordinary, the, the way that I currently do things, certainly, like this isn't made by me, but this is a you know Schrodinger equation simulator that somebody made. Um, and it's written in GLSL, and it's, I was about to say it's horrible code, I mean, it's, no, it's, it's great code, it's an excellent simulation, but, um, and it's very terse, but it's not readable, it is, it's readable if you already understand the Schrodinger equation and GLSL. Um, uh, with geometric algebra operation, the, Every operation in geometric algebra, I think, can be given a, a visualization and a, and a simple visualization. And th those are things that I'd like to make. And then using those to be the code, well, it certainly sounds like fun. Um, and I claim it'll be useful for um, explaining the system, the, the interactive visual systems that I make. Um, uh, there's uh, some excellent discourse on this already, um, stuff like uh, Learnable Programming, an essay by Brett Victor, um, Legible Mathematics by uh, Glenn Chiacchieri, and um, and then Ken Perlin, again, you know, also talks about this kind of thing. Um, as an analogy, uh, which I might as well use, um, if you wanted to, like, if you had, like, a caveman or like a medieval architect from a thousand years ago travel through time to the present day um not a cave person like a you know an a builder from a long long time ago certainly if they were to look around and see the skyscrapers that we've got today they might be pretty impressed and what is the sky what is well what is not skyscraper but what's the building that you might take them to um to intrigue them. I claim that you could do worse, certainly, than showing them the Pompidou Center. Uh, the Pompidou Center being an example of a building where you see, you get some insight into what the building, uh, how the building works from just looking at it. Whereas usually all of the effort, the complexity of the building is hidden from you. Um, yeah, wanna have that approach to uh, designing a, co a coding system. So one way of doing this is uh, what you might call programming by diagram, um, which, uh, and there are a few systems that I would say do this well. Um, uh, Brett Victor um, was inspiring to a lot of people, including me with this. I mean, he never, didn't really give a name to it, but uh, this is an interesting system um, for you might say that it's a smaller version of MATLAB, um, so making a making graphs for scientific publications. Um, but you know it's more ambitious than that at the same time. Um, uh, the mm, apparatus is inspired directly by this one. Um, Pain is an interesting language. Uh, uh, well, I say language, you know, system. Um, GeoGebra and Desmos have a lot of uh, have had a lot of success, specifically in um, you know they they they're more than just graphing calculators. They they um, allow the allow kids to in, in a classroom to mm, 
interact with the visualization they've got in a way that has a bearing on the code. Um, uh, Deep UI was really just a demo, um, and uh, but and this sort of seems to have disappeared. But it seemed it was kind of interesting, um, and you know it. I I have this thing up here to show that to try and to suggest that there's something of this that already happens with um uh with programming today uh debug visualizations are a very very important and good part of good programming um trying to program without visualization you a video game um it's got a representation as code, and then that code gets turned into pixels on the screen. Um, you might naively say all the visualizations, all of the pixels that, if I put some pixels onto the screen, it's to contribute to the video game. But no, that's not true. You should probably um, make debug visualizations, which are visualizations that will not end up in the final game. They are things to give you, the programmer, insight into the system. Um, there's a good word for, by the way, which is construal, um, which is when you're programming a system kind of as an end unto itself. You're programming a system to uh, come up with. Um, it, it, you're you're programming a system purely in order to give you insight into that system. Um, and that's what you might say is possible to make with stuff like apparatus and uh, breakfast, bet breakfast thing. Um, and it's worth distinguishing uh, all of, when I say programming by dia diagram, um, there is, you know, there's this thing that we call, th there's visual programming. Uh, visual programming is a catch all term. Um, and think about stuff like this, which is the Grail system from 1968, which is an extremely impressive system. And uh, this kind of visual programming definitely has its place. You might you might call it flow based, um, but it's not really what I'm talking about. I do not like the wires that you get in such systems, so don't want that. Um, and I would say that uh, projective geometric algebra in particular can enable um, scalable programming by diagram for graphics. Say scalable, um, yeah, it, it, you can build things of quite a lot of complexity. Um, uh, or ordinarily we have this, of course, um, but you know we want we, like in computer graphics you draw you know you draw in your notebook or in, on your whiteboard to communicate to your colleagues lots and lots of images like this um, and even though an image like this does have quite a um, does have quite quite an unambiguous formal interpretation um, can have an unambiguous formal interpretation, you know, it ends up get being turned into this kind of thing, which is a pity. Um, and this this is a slide from a talk by Stephen Dekenick. I think it's Dekenick. Um, <laughs> he'll correct me. Uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, you know, th this this slide. He just meant it as an illustration, but this almost looks like code. You know, you, you can see some like declarations up here um, and then, you know, line after line, you're defining new objects. Um, and, you know, you could, you know, you could write these out, but you could also imagine interacting with this uh, visualization here and, you know, clicking here and, you know, or, or drawing a vague line here that gets snapped to the actual line and that sort of creates these lines of code. Um, and with what I want to build, I'd want it to be even more visual, something like, like you don't even have like this, this algebra looking thing, or this, or this English lang, you know, part, um, this vernacular description of, um, the, uh, of what you want to do. You, you can program completely with pictures. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, to give and to... So I want to make I want to make a, an editor or and maybe a 
plugin for existing popular editors, such as Visual Studio Code, which is what I use. Um, how well this works out, I this will work out, obviously, I don't know. Um, uh, but um, Visual Studio Code makes it very easy to do, at least. Um, but, you know, some vague hopes, like, initially I'll have... Um, no specific language, just the simplest language that I can imagine doing this with, which is Lambda Calculus, Union, Projective Geometric, geometric Algebra, and maybe with, you know, the, um, the, the Nabler operator, the differential operator, um, uh, because I want it to be programming in a way that's that's something that allows you to program the kinds of things that physicists want to think about. Um, and then for use in that uh, assessment platform that I described earlier for the course. Um, eventually, I would want to target other things, like you have this editor output some GLSL or HLSL that you can put into your um, video game that you might be making, uh, or and maybe use some statically typed libraries like 3JS, uh, well, statically typed libraries like GLM, um, maybe the code can be converted into Unity functions for people who want that. Um, ideally, ideally, because it's, again it's also about physics, um, I would want to be able to be backwards compatible with previous uh, discourse on geometric algebra. So make it so that some LaTeX equations can be passed, transpiled into um, into something compatible with this editor. Um, and MATLAB code as well. Yeah. Lofty ambitions, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, Oh, and just just because I thought of it thought of it just now, uh, another advantage of having an uh, having an assessment platform that is um, a of having a digital assessment platform is that uh, things can be automated. You can automatically check whether the student has successfully simulated um, a given system, just like on Codabyte. Okay. Gotta go through. Okay, I've got a drop down menu, blah, 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 and we go to here. Okay, this is the roadmap for this project. Um, time flow. Okay, I'm gonna start with a simple visualization of like CL3 objects and operations um, with a pocket calculator interface. I mean, po when I say pocket calculator interface, I just mean like have this object and this object and you apply the operation and you see a visualization of that. Figuring out what the visualizations should look like is non-trivial in itself. Um, I've got some, I I've got some ideas for like how to represent um, quaternions and complex numbers in a setting with uh, vectors um, but not sure. And but, but but an immediate use for them is uh, to you know put stuff on geometric algebra on the, on the relevant articles on Wikipedia, the dual quaternions articles, screw theory, whatever. Get just make it as easy as possible for people to stumble upon geometric algebra. Um, once with with those visualizations in hand, um, we can have a coding environment. Um, you know they don't have to be great in order to have this. But, uh, yeah, um, GDC Math for Game Programmers lecture um, might be another immediate application of the visualizations. Um, uh, and this would be also a good way of um, getting feedback from the community on maybe the coding environment. I'd eventually want to have a Visual Studio Code extension based on this. I've already started this, by the way. Um, uh, and indeed, you know, down here, so basic mis mixed reality for making videos of physical demonstrations. Um, it's not a very... Um, it doesn't have all the features that I want by any means, but, you know. Um, 
eventually we can make that physics course assessment platform, you know, a website where you can go to start programming using the editor, uh, start trying to reproduce the behavior of a multi-vector, um, uh, eventually leading to the physics course lecture videos, which would have the physical demonstrations. It would use the editor as well, I'm thinking. It would also involve me doing ordinary um, pictures uh, of the kind that physicists and geometers need to draw to explain things, um, because probably not every picture that we want to draw can be like formally passed into a computer system and made made into a simulation of a mathematical idea. Some of them have to be described using these more vague um, these vague suggestions. Uh, uh, backpedaling a little bit. Um, so live coding videos would be a good way of, um, well, certainly showing, oh, here's a bunch of things that you can do using geometric algebra. You can make a simulation of fluid dynamics. You can make a simulation of rigid body dynamics. And look, it's only like four lines of code or whatever it is. Um, and those would, uh, and certainly that like, there's a lot of, you know, if they're based in the if they you if they're based in Unity or something like this, um, then there's a lot of people who might want that, and it would become a good way for them to uh, easily gain e e get an immediate handle on something that they can use to give themselves the fundamental understanding that we want them to have. Um, uh, somewhere along the way, I would work on the graphics of this thing. I mean, so. I want to have, uh, at least very briefly, a professional artist. For example, like, one way of visualizing the geometric product is like, oh, you've got a little cartoon character, um, like, called Marcy the Mule, because it's a multiplier or something like that, and the mule comes along and it picks up, you know, the vector and it comes and you know or you 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 pick up the mule the mule picks up the vector yeah the and the 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 mule is happy or it's sad if you put it back down again and it does what it does to the vectors what need to be done to turn it into the multi vector that you then want um and with improved graphics uh we can make something that's you know, more professional, maybe make a video game that people will actually want to play, um, and yeah, thereby get it, get the geometric ideas out there to um, people who have maybe finished with school, but they like a puzzle game every now and again. Um, and then eventually, uh, so I do, I believe that uh, augmented reality is, you know, coming in a, I don't know, seven years or whatever, um, and we will be eventually just walking around and virtual objects will be everywhere. Um, you will have, you know, people won't bother wearing fancy clothes anymore, we'll just adorn our bodies with virtual objects. We'll, we'll carry all of our favourite gifts from the last week around, like, behind us, so we can say, oh, did you see this one? And show it to our friends. That's the, that's the future that I think is pretty much inevitable, um, and I want to use geometric algebra to prepare us for that, to make it so that it's turned to a productive purpose, um, because these abstract mathematical entities, like parabolas, vectors, dual quaternions, they are around us the entire time. And, um, and we even use them all the time, whenever we pick something up, and, you know, whenever we tie our shoelaces, for example, we just don't know that we're using them. Um, we want a course that drums that into people, um, make it so that they can't stop seeing maths everywhere, instead of having to spend hours explaining to them why maths is kind of useful. Um, and so, you know, I want, I want it to be the case that 
there's you know kids can kids um they're walking around and they just see the vectors and if they want to play like a game together like they want to play a game where you know they're throwing the frisbee but um they want the frisbee to curve as much as possible then they can immediately like make a game where like oh we're going to measure like how you've curved the frisbee in this way and this is the kind of score that we're going to try and get i want them to be able to i want little kids to make that kind of game in five li- with five lines of code and then start playing that game whenever they want um and yeah and then once i'm finished with this project um, I kind of want to do the same thing with statistics instead of geometry. Um, yeah, but, and that might give me enough work to last for the whole rest of my career. Who knows? And that's the end of the talk. Um, if you would, if you're interested in this project, um, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it. Uh, Uh, These are the various ways that you can contact me.